concise history of the First Crusade. This video podcast is a collaboration between Flashpoint History and the Ancient History Guide, two excellent sources dedicated to making history accessible, interesting, and perhaps a little snarky. It wasn't just the peasantry that took heed of Urban's call. Many lords and princes of Europe also came forth. So instead of an aggressive, rowdy mob, you instead had an aggressive, well-trained, heavily armed force. And it was an impressive entourage. From southern Italy came Bohemond of Toronto, known to be a giant of a man, and his ruthless nephew, Tancred. From southern France came Raymond of Toulouse, who escorted the bishop, now papal legate, Adamar of Le Puy. Starting in Normandy came Duke Robert, the son of William the Conqueror. Warfare was just ingrained in his genetic code. From Lorraine came Godfrey of Bouillon, along with his two brothers, Eustace and Baldwin of Boulogne. Godfrey sold most of his property to go on crusade, and it was said that he intended never to return. And then there was the less than spectacular Stephen of Blois, who was said to have been bullied into going on crusade by his wife, who just happened to be the daughter of William the Conqueror. She must have been an impressive woman. Unlike Godfrey, Stephen had every intention of getting back to his homeland. These contingents moved across Europe and arrived in Constantinople in late 1096. Alexius I had expected a few thousand well-trained warriors. The crusade army that arrived at his doorstep was estimated to be over 60,000 strong. He realized right away that it wouldn't be a good idea to keep a well-armed and hungry force waiting for too long on his front lawn. The crusade leaders were thus asked to swear an oath to return Byzantine land to the emperor, and then they were quickly ferried across into Asia. Once into Anatolia, the crusaders moved in on Nicaea. Nicaea was an impressive city. It was here that Constantine the Great held the famous council of Nicaea in 325, which established the Nicene Creed, and thus Christian Orthodoxy. It also happened to be the capital of Kilij Arslan's Sultanate. The Crusaders laid siege to the city and beat off a relief force, but at the last second, in June of 1097, the garrison decided to surrender to the Byzantine who offered them better terms. The Emperor's troops snuck in and took over Nicaea, and as can be imagined, this put considerable strain on the Crusader-Byzantine relation as the Latin Knights felt that they'd been robbed of their rightful plunder. The emperor dutifully reminded them of their oath, but more importantly, he found a way to bribe them with a town treasury and convince them to move on. The army divided into two marching columns. Bohemond of Toronto took the lead with Godfrey of Bouillon taking up the rear guard. They marched deeper into Asia Minor towards the city of Doraleum, but as they moved, Kilij Arslan sent in his army again, and near Doraleum, an ambush was set. The Crusaders were now marching into a trap. I'm gonna let my co-author, Ancient History Guy, fill in what happened next. On the 1st of July, Beaumont's force was suddenly surrounded outside Doraleum by Kilij Arslan. Beaumont's knights quickly mounted, however the attempt at counter-attacking the Turks did very little, who due to them not being as heavily armed as the Crusaders, easily fell back. As a result, Beaumont ordered his knights to dismount and form a defensive line. This formation sheltered the more vulnerable men-at-arms and non-combatants, but it also allowed the Turks to have free range of the battlefield. Despite having this free range of the battlefield, the Turkish arrows would have little effect on the heavily armoured crusaders. As a result, the Turkish horse archers would charge, let loose a few volleys, and then retreat before the Crusaders could counterattack. Eventually, the hail of arrows began to take a toll on the unprotected horses and non-combatants. Beaumont sent messages asking the other Crusader armies for aid. By this time, he had already lost 2,000 men. 
Just after midday, Godfrey arrived with a force of 50 knights, fighting his way through the Turkish lines to reinforce Bohemond. After seven hours, Raymond's knights finally arrived, launching a surprise attack across the Turkish flank. Finally, a force led by Bishop Adhemar of Lepuy, the papal legate, arrived in mid-afternoon, moving around the battlefield by hiding his forces behind hills and across the river. Adhemar's force charged into the Turkish camp and attacked the Turks from the rear. Terrified by the sight of their camps in flames, the Turkish army fell into disarray, abandoning their camp and forcing Kilij Arslan to withdraw from the battlefield. By the end of the battle, the Turks had lost around 3,000 men, whilst the Crusaders had lost somewhere around 4,000 despite being victorious. Kilij Arslan after this battle gave the Crusaders a wide berth, but would shadow the assailing force, usually recapturing anything they took. There was a reason for his caution. Aside from he himself being defeated in battle by the Crusaders, the Islamic world at this time was heavily fractured. The Seljuk Empire had broken apart into many states with the death of their great Sultan, Malik Shah, in 1092. The local rulers who came to power, who were known as Atabegs, were embroiled in warring against one another and also against the Fatimid Caliphate, which was of Shia Islam. Kilij Arslan had plenty of other enemies, and he, like the rest of the Middle East, would be puzzled as to the motives and the goals of this large invading horde. The Crusaders moved on to central Anatolia almost unopposed, and in mid-August managed to capture the city of Iconium. But shortly thereafter, at the city of Heraclea, after a minor skirmish, they decided to split up. The main body of the Crusader force took a northeastern route through the mountains of Cappadocia, which was a trying ordeal, resulting in the deaths or starvation of many. Whereas Tancred and Baldwin of Boulogne went south, hugging the coast into Cilicia, where they proceeded to take the city at Tarsus. Tancred and his men would eventually rejoin the main force, but Baldwin had another idea and headed further east. He wanted to find a small, rich, and most importantly politically weak kingdom to exploit, and he found this in Edessa. Now it was through, let's just call it, political resourcefulness and sheer audacity that he became the lord of what would become the county of Edessa. Give Baldwin a little time. He was upwardly mobile and destined for bigger things in the future than simply being a count. Now the main body of the crusade army descended on Antioch in late 1097, at one point, Antioch was one of the greatest cities of the Roman Empire. By some estimates, she ranked second only to Rome herself. She was now a bit past her prime, but was still an important landmark. In essence, she wasn't a city that could be easily bypassed. Ancient history guy, why don't you give us the glorious details of the crusade encounter at Antioch? The Crusaders arrived outside the city of Antioch on the 21st of October and began the siege. The city was well protected, with huge walls and turrets, as well as a citadel positioned on top of a hill as a last line of defence. The 5,000 Turkish defenders had been aware of the approaching Crusaders, and had therefore gathered up a large stockpile of supplies in anticipation of the siege. However, the Crusaders only besieged one side of the city, as a result, the Muslim defenders attempted to sally out, but this was unsuccessful, and they soon retreated back behind their tall walls. After using up all the available food in the immediate area, the Crusaders began to send out foraging parties further afield. On the 31st of December, one of these foraging parties encountered a Turkish relief army led by the governor of Damascus. The Muslim relief army was soon defeated, and the battered Crusaders returned backwards towards Antioch. A lack of food continued to be a problem, supplies were dwindling, and in early 1098, one in seven of the Crusaders were dying from starvation. Hungry, and with morale low, many began to desert the Crusading army. In this time, the Crusaders had to deal with another relief army, which was quickly beaten back. Fed up with the sad state of affairs, Beaumont secretly established contact with someone inside the city, called Firuz. Firuz was an Armenian guard who controlled the Tower of the Two Sisters. As a result of a few bribes, the Armenian agreed to help the Crusader. The need to capture Antioch was made far greater as the Crusaders became aware 
that a large relief army led by Ker Boga was on its way. After a bit of bickering in the Crusaders' camp, it was agreed that Beaumont would lead a stealth mission to open the city gates, and in return, he would become the Prince of Antioch. In the middle of the night, Farouz allowed a small group of Crusaders, including Beaumont, to scale the walls. The Crusaders then proceeded to open the gate, and finally, the Crusaders captured the city, and proceeded to kill as many non-Christians as they could. However, it turns out the Crusaders could not distinguish between Christians and non-Christians, and many were killed. However, the citadel remained in the hands of the Muslim defenders, who would be held up for many more days to come. Kaboga began the second siege against the Crusaders. The food situation became desperate. Suddenly, a monk claimed to have had a vision, and after leading an excavation mission to the Cathedral of St. Peter, discovered what was said to be the Holy Land. Raymond declared it to be a divine sign, and after five days of fasting, the crusading army, now without any horses, sallied out to face the besieging army. Kaboga watched, not believing the situation to be as serious as it actually was. By the time he realised the size of the Crusader army, it was already too late. Kaboga was backed into a corner. Hoping to lure the Crusaders onto Roughland, Kaboga slowly retreated. Kaboga finally managed to engage his main line, however the Crusaders easily pushed this line back, causing confusion and eventually a mass rout. This defeat of the final relief army finally convinced the remaining Muslim defenders to surrender.